Hello, everybody. Welcome to Saturday Night SQL Virtual Chapter Webinar. My name is Sarah Huang. I'm the uh, organizer of this uh, virtual chapter. Join me here uh, is Debbie Huang, uh, who is my uh, our co-organizer. Uh, tonight, um, Kathy uh, Kallenberger is going to present uh, indexing fundamentals. Uh, before uh, her presentation, I'm going to go through a few slides, then I'll trans transfer the screen over to her. Um, oops, why? Okay. Um, on July, uh, sorry, January 11th, 2017, there's a business analytics day in Chicago. Uh, it's a very good opportunity if you would like to attend. Um, also, the Civic Technology Movement webinar is going to be hosted by the PASS Business Analytics Virtual Chapter um, on December 20th. Uh, past e store still has uh, some uh, past summit 2016 items uh, for sale right now. Uh, these are the selected uh, virtual chapter meetings uh, for the remainder of this month. Uh, there's there are a few more, uh, say December 20th and 21st. Uh, you can check it uh, out. And future chapter meetings uh, of our virtual chapter uh, in January. Um, Devin Knight is going to present advanced uh, Power BI uh, solving the hard problems. Uh, in February, uh, Andy Yuan is going to present why your data type choices matter. And in April, uh, Hai Dong Ji is going to present initial impressions of SQL Server v.next public preview. Uh, we have uh, we, we have a few more. Um, I will uh, post them later. And I'm told to help spread the word. Uh, uh, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, there are a couple of BI developer positions that, uh, that are open right now. If you are interested, please, please send me an email to um, Saturday Night SQL at sqlpass.org. I'll forward you the uh, detailed job description. And PASS has many virtual chapters. Uh, and feel free to join as many as you would like. And of course, uh, if you are not a member of our virtual chapter, you're more than welcome to join us. Ours is a Saturday Night SQL virtual chapter. And uh, Kathy Kallenberger uh, is uh, the Women's in Technology virtual chapter over here. Uh, and I think you don't have to be a women to join this virtual chapter. <laughs> that, is, that is true. We have several men that are in the chapter, yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you for confirming that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested, there are some uh, upcoming SQL Saturdays in 2017, in January, February. Um, so if, uh, you can visit SQLSaturday.com to check, check them out. And PASS is run, mostly run by volunteers. So if you would like to volunteer, please visit volunteer.sqlpass.org. And if you are not a member, please join PASS. Uh, this is a free membership. And after you join uh, this wonderful organization, you, uh, you can join as many uh, as uh, virtual chapters or local chapters. And if you would like to ask questions or join a discussion uh, during the session, uh, well, we, um, at the end of uh, Cassie's presentation, uh, you, you can 
uh, either raise your hand so you can interact uh, directly with Cassie or uh, other audience uh, uh, or you can um, post your questions on the chat window over here. Right. Okay. Um, without further ado, I'm going to transfer the screen over to Cassie. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you so much for uh, willing to present for our virtual chapter. You're welcome. I am just happy that some people decided to stay home from going to the new Star Wars movie and, inst and instead are learning about SQL Server on a Saturday night. That's pretty cool. So, can you see the screen okay? Yes, yes. And I still see this GoToWebinar. I still see it. I don't know if you see the icon or not. The, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm seeing I your slides. Just the slides. Okay, good. Thank uh -huh. you. All right. Um, yes, thank you all of you very much for joining me this evening. We're going to be talking about, well, indexing for beginners. I changed the title a little bit. This really is a, a beginner webinar. Um, I felt like indexing fundamentals almost sounded like I was going to start looking more at internals. And this is really beginner skills is what we'll be looking at. Um, she told you a little bit about me. I consider myself foremost to be a teacher. I'm also an author. I get several books out, and I'm a Pluralsight author as well. Um, I make most of my living as a consultant. It would be really cool if I could make uh, just be an author all the time, but I, I am also a consultant. And you can find me occasionally on Twitter, Aunt Kathy. Um, my website is Aunt Kathy SQL, and you can always contact me through there. So as a consultant, I go to lots of different customers, and I'm, I hear the same things over and over. The application's slow. I, we are seeing timeouts. Um, sometimes they think something's wrong with the SQL server, you know, or SQL server is no good. You know, why, you know it must not be good if, if things are not fast. Um, sometimes the customers start throwing hardware at the problem. I often see that they'll add processors. A lot of the customers that I work with do not have a database administrator on staff. A lot of times they are software shops that maybe ha are hosting a, a software as a service application, or sometimes it's a department in a larger company uh, that has uh, that, that run their own SQL Server in their department, but they don't really have a SQL Server DBA on hand. So they don't really understand a lot about it. Um, but often, often they'll throw more processors or think there's something wrong with the storage. But usually, and almost always, there are issues with queries and indexing. A lot of times without adding additional hardware, you can, you can have the right indexes or add the right indexes and all of a sudden things are much, much faster. Um, sometimes they have indexes, they've added some, but they aren't sure if they've got the right ones. Right? So like I said, they've added processors sometimes, sometimes they've upgraded storage, uh, sometimes they've added random indexes just to see what helps. I remember first learning about indexes probably close to, I'm going to say, over 15 years ago when I first was learning about indexes. There was an applic it was when I was one of those accidental DBAs and I first became a DBA. There was an application that was really slow and there were lots of issues with it. And it, it really was, the main thing was how the database uh, how, the, how the server hardware was configured was really one of the biggest problems. But I remember uh, the CEO at the time asking me, are there indexes on this database? Uh, she didn't ask, are the right indexes there? Are the indexes effective? Just are there indexes? Like there's some kind of magic thing. Just adding indexes should make your queries run faster. Well, guess what? They have to be the right ones or it's not going to help. And in fact, it could make things worse if you add a lot of them and those indexes have to be updated whenever there are changes to the data. 
So the idea behind indexes is that we want to make SQL Server make SQL Server work less hard, make SQL Server not have so much to do, make it not have to get the data from disk and bring it into memory so much. We want to, we want to make the workload less. If we do that, then we've got some headroom. We can continue to have uh, an application that has increasing number of users, increasing amount of data, and we've got some headroom and that hardware is going to last longer, that implementation is going to last longer. If we have to read an entire table, I'm hearing some background noise, maybe one of the, um, one of the, uh, oh, sorry. yeah, it's okay, if you want to mute, mute that for now, thank you. All right, so, if we, if we, let's say we have a large table, if SQL Server has to read that entire table from disk into memory, that's a lot of work. What if we could let SQL Server instead work with a smaller object, an index? Even if SQL Server has to scan or read that entire index, it's still doing less work. So that's the idea. We want SQL Server to have to look at a smaller amount of data. And the way that data is stored in, in SQL Server is in pages, and I'm sure that most of you out there know that. But what we really would like to do is get SQL Server to, to work with a smaller number of pages on any given query. So to just, to, just to show you, I've got a simulation. This is not exactly the algorithm that SQL Server uses, but I've got a little simulation that shows you how uh, indexes work. All right, so I have a table that's a heap. What, and I'll explain what a heap is in just a little bit. I'm sure that quite a few of you know what a heap is, but I'm going to also assume that there's quite a few out there that do not, especially if you are a beginner in understanding indexes. So in this case, what this is, it's a table that has no organization to it. And don't worry about this code, but the simulation starts out by choosing a number between 1 and 1,000. And then it starts looking through the numbers in that table until it finds the number. So let me just go ahead and run this. Here, the number is 409, and it had to look through 617 numbers before it found that. Let's try that again. The number is 815. It had to look through 358 numbers to find that. So what's happening is that it's scanning the table. It's actually scanning, trying to find that number. If I have an index, this is um, basically a, a, an algorithm that you might learn in computer science is what I'm doing here. Again, it's not exactly an index. And just to make things a little more difficult, instead of looking through a thousand numbers, I'm going to look through 10,000 numbers. This would be 10,000 unique numbers. So let's look. We're looking for the number 8,352, and we found it in 13 guesses. That seems really quick. Let me try that again just to make sure that wasn't just luck. Ah, 13 guesses again. What if we increase this number? Let's change it to a million. Did I, do I have a million there? Looks like a million, and let's see what happens. We are looking for the number 808,971, and we found it in 20 guesses. Let's try that again. Again, a large number found in 20 guesses. You may see a pattern here. We're looking at the logarithm of the uh, number to the base 10. I believe I said that right. Been a long time since I've thought about logarithms, but basically, um, if we are looking through a, a th looking through a million numbers by using this algorithm, we can always find the number we're looking for by just looking at 20 numbers. And that's similar to the way that indexes work. The data is organized. SQL Server can basically jump through to the correct number it's trying to find. And again, that was a simulation. It's not. 100% exactly how SQL Server works with indexes, but again, it just shows you that if the data is organized, you can find what you need quicker. So let's start with, let's see if I can find the right thing. 
There we go. We're going to start talking about tables. And the reason we're going to start talking about tables is that some of the time a table is an index. Okay? Um, there are two types of tables. And again, this is a beginner talk. We're not going to talk about the more advanced advanced features like in memory OLTP and um, XML indexes and things like that, or column store indexes. This is just the basics that we're going to talk about tonight. So just two basic types of tables are heaps and clustered indexes. One of my favorite ways to think about these is when I think about something in our real life, I like books. I love books, whether they be electronic or a book I can hold in my hand. I love books. Um, if I have a novel, if I have a book that I'm going to read in an analog fashion from the beginning to the end, that book is organized in what's called a heap. Okay? If I look at the book, if I look at the first sentence in the book, the words are not alphabetized. The words are not organized in a way that a computer would organize them. They're not put in an order. Uh, that's what's called a heap. And in fact, if I took a novel and if I alphabetized the words, that novel would no longer make sense at all. So just like in, in, in uh, your database, in real life, Sometimes it makes sense not to have a table organized. Most of the time we do want it organized, though. There are certain situations where we may not. In the real world, having a novel or having a textbook, it makes sense that these words are not organized according to alpha, alpha, alphabetical or some other uh, way to organize it. A really great example of this other type of table, which is we call a clustered index. So what I'm going to tell you, if this is new to you, the clustered index is the table, the table is the clustered index. So the really great example of this is a dictionary. If I look at a dictionary, I have a section at the very beginning that just lists the words that start with A. I also have some other information. I have the pronunciation, I have the origin, where did that word come from, I have a number of definitions, I have uh, possibly, let's say it's a word that has other uh, derivatives that maybe uh, you change it a little bit and it becomes an, an adjective and you look at it another way, it's a noun, that sort of thing. But this book is ordered. This, this dictionary is ordered. The data is the index, the index is the data, you know, and that's what a clustered index is. That's what a table. I've had um, people in sessions at SQL Saturdays argue with me that that's impossible, the table can't be an index, but I will, help, you know, if it doesn't make sense, just take a leap of faith with me. Also, another interesting uh, thing that you might have might get whenever you're interviewing for a job is that uh, one of the one of the common uh, questions is how many clustered indexes can a table have well hopefully you get that it can be one I, and you'll hear often hear people say I'm going to add a clustered index to this table what they really mean is, I'm going to turn the table into a clustered index. I never hear anybody say it like that, but that's really what they're doing. If I add a clustered index to a table, I'm actually turning the table into a clustered index. So let's take a look at some examples here. I'm using the AdventureWorks 2014 database, and it's got a lot of small tables. Uh, one of my friends, Adam Mechanic, and you probably have heard of Adam, he may have even spoken for your, your group before, he has some scripts out there that you can use to create some other big tables, and I like to use Adam scripts to create these pretty decent sized tables. Uh, one of them is Big Transaction History, and it's got about 30 million rows, so I like working with that because it's easier to show differences in uh, performance on a big table. 
Um, I also created another table called Big Product 2. So the difference between these two tables is this one is a heap. This one is not organized. This one is a clustered index. So the original table from Adam is a clustered index. I created a copy of it as a heap. And I'm going to turn on the execution plan. For those of you who are not familiar with the execution plan, it will give us a lot of information about how SQL Server processes the query, how SQL Server uh, accesses the data, what happens along the way. It's a really great tool for query tuning. And um, if you haven't seen it before, then tonight you'll learn a little bit about it. And for your homework, start digging in and learning more. So what we're going to do is we're going to run this first query that is a heap. And I hear a baby crying in the background. That will only be going on for a couple minutes if you can hear him. He's getting ready for bed. Grandpa's getting him ready. So that query actually ran pretty quickly. It took about a minute, or I'm sorry, a second to run. And if I look at, let's see, I don't have anything there. If I look at the execution plan, it's showing me that a table scan was run on Big Product 2. That makes sense. It's a table. If you, if whenever you scan a, ta a heap, it's always going to show table and scan because I don't have a where clause. Uh, but guess what? In this case, I there's no index on the table, so there's no way I could do anything else but scan it. But the fact that there's no where clause, um, I'm going to have to look at the entire table anyway. So that's one way. Excuse me. That's one way I can look at a table by scanning it. Okay, so let's take a look at the clustered index. If I execute that, um, it also took about a second, but again, it's the same amount of data. The difference is that when I look at the execution plan, I see a different operator. We're still scanning because we don't have a where clause. We're still scanning, but the we see something different. We see a different operator, and it says clustered index scan. Because remember, the clustered index is the table. The table is the clustered index. I can also take a look over here in Object Explorer, and if I take a look at big product and look at the indexes, I can see the index right there, and it says clustered. Big product. It has in parentheses clustered. If I take a look at Big Product 2, there's actually no indexes at all. All right, so let's continue on. So if I have a heap and I want to look for a particular number, for example, the, the A, a particular value, not number, then what I have to do is search through each row until I find what I'm looking for. And in fact, there's no guarantee that I won't have multiple values, so I really have to keep searching through the whole thing. The way that the heap is organized is that the data is added in order of how it's inserted. So uh, there's pointers probably going both directions here, but there's no logic to it. It's just basically how the data was added to the table. The cluster index structure is different. Again, this is extremely simplified compared to what really is going on, but I think this is a good way to illustrate kind of what's happening. Even though the clustered index is one object, it's kind of divided into two different sections. We have, oh, for, before I do that, let's go through this. If I'm looking for A, I start at the top. Uh, again, this is that same algorithm that I showed you. A real index is going to be much flatter. It's not going to be binary like this one. Um, it is it is a structure called a B tree, but that stands for balance tree, not binary tree. So I'm always going to go down a path to find my value in a clustered index. All right, so the clustered index structure 
has two sections to it. The top part, or if you want, so I see some people flipping this upside down because the idea is similar to a tree that you might see outside. The root is the very top, and then the bottom down here is the leaf level. Okay, so the leaves. So it's really like an upside down tree. Um, at the very top, the non leaf level, this section, contains the key. So if we're looking at our dictionary, this will actually be just the words. You know, just the words. And there's also a leaf level. And in my mind, this is what, I, when I think about a clustered index or any table, this is the part that I really think about. This is the part that, um, where all the other parts of the data. So in our dictionary, not only are we repeating the word down here, but we are also, have the pronunciation, we have the uh, definitions, origin, anything else that's in the dictionary. All right, so what happened? So, probably 95% of the times, the clustered index key is also the primary key. The primary key must be unique, all right? I'm going to say 90, 95% of the time, I'm just making that number up. I have no idea. I haven't gone out and checked all the databases out there, but a large number. By default, if I add a primary key to a table, by default, it will create a clustered index. I can override that behavior, but if I don't override it on purpose, I'll get a clustered index. If for some reason that cluster key and is not the primary key, it's not unique, then SQL Server will add what's called a uniqueifier. I think I have spelled that right, but I think that's like a word that doesn't exist in a dictionary. But this uniqueifier is kind of like a, just a number. We never see that number, but it allows each row to be considered unique, or each key, I should say, each key to be considered unique so that uh, you can easily find any particular row. Okay, so each row has got, to, actually each row has got to be unique, so that's where SQL Server will add the uniqueifier if needed. All right, so let's head back over to demos and let's do a search on a table. There's another couple of interesting tools that you can use with SQL Server for query tuning. My favorite is Statistics.io. This tells me how many pages SQL Server had to touch in order to solve the query. Uh, you can also use that statistics time on. Uh, that's more useful if you are looking at larger tables. Sometimes if you're tuning something that is, uh, doesn't take long to run, just like in a few milliseconds, it's not quite as useful. But they're both really good tools. I'm also going to do something else. Uh, don't do this at home. I'm going to do this drop clean buffers so that I can um, knock everything out of memory lock everything out of the buffers so that I'm not relying on any data that might already be sit there and any, we're starting cold. All right, so and also let's, let's not turn that on. Oh yeah, turn that on. Okay, we'll turn that on as well. All right, again, I have a big transaction history table that I got from Adam and I, with, with the indexes and the primary key also, the cluster key is transaction ID. I also have a heap that I created. So if I run this, it comes up very quickly. If I take a look at the execution plan, again, we're using the clustered index, but this time we're using a seek. SQL Server was able to not look at every row. SQL Server was able to use that non-leaf level, the top of the index, to find the row it needed very quickly. If we look over in the Messages tab, did I not row, did I not run this? Let's do that again. Okay, let's do this again. And do that again. Talked about Statistics IO, didn't run it. Okay, so I can see that the time you know, six milliseconds it looks like here. Uh, one of the things I don't like about 
the IO is that we get so many items here it's kind of hard to know exactly what to look at. Um, here's the information from statistics IO instead of statistics time. The important thing to look at here is logical reads three. That's how many pages SQL Server touched in order to run this query. Logical reads three. Probably looked at two pages in the index plus the page where the row existed. I'm going to run this again just to make sure that we don't have any data in memory. I'm going to run a similar query against the excuse me the heap. You can already see it's taking longer. It took three seconds. The execution plan is telling me it's doing I'm seeing a lot of interesting things here in fact. I'm seeing a table scan because there's no index. It had to look at every single row. I'm seeing something called parallelism. The SQL Server has decided that it was so much work for this query that it was going to break things down over multiple threads. That's something for an entirely different talk. I'm also seeing that it said, hey, there's an index that might be useful for this query. And Here's something uh, I see once in a while. Notice that it gives you the script to create the index, but it doesn't tell you the name. It expects you will fill in the name. Um, I, you know what? If I just run it like this, I will get an index called bracket uh, less than name of missing index comma sys name comma greater than closing bracket. I will. I have actually seen this in the wild. I've seen places that have an index uh, on several tables with this name. So don't do that. That's not cool. Anyway, um, a lot of times I have seen places that anytime they're given a missing index hint, they automatically go out and create it. I'm going to say don't blindly do that. Take a look at what's already there. Sometimes uh, it's telling you to add an index that you have another index that's just almost exactly the same. So be careful there. It's a good tool, but don't blindly follow that advice. So we did see that having the clustered index made this, and we're searching on the cluster key, made the query much faster. All right, let's move on. There's a lot to cover here. All right, so as far as clustered indexes, what should you do? Should you use clustered index? Should you not? I'm going to say that you probably want to do use clustered indexes most of the time. The main reason I've seen not using clustered index is often like a staging database where you're loading data into a staging database as part of an ETL process and then you're going to do a transform and load into a data warehouse. A lot of times those staging tables will not have clustered indexes. There's probably a dozen other reasons um, but most of the time you will see clustered indexes. You would like to make the cluster key narrow. The reason for that is that um, I'll explain a little bit more later, but that cluster key will get copied into all of what I'm going to cover next, the non-clustered indexes, copied into every one of those. So we want to make it narrow. We want to we also, if possible, would like to make it unique. Uh, luckily, most of the time, the uh, primary key and the cluster key are the same. In that case, it is unique. Uh, we would like to make it never changing. The reason that we would like to make it never changing, something that a key that doesn't change is because it's, it, if it does change, guess what? Then all of a sudden, that row is in the wrong page and, it's, and we've got to either move it or, um, you know, and that ends up causing fragmentation. Um, also, and it depends on the workload, also, it's nice if that clustered index is incrementing. It really depends on the workload. Um, I have seen lots and lots of de debates about this. Some people argue, well, yes, use an identity column. Other people argue and say, use a GUID. So it really just depends on the situation. All right, so let's 
we've looked at tables, two types of tables. Now we're going to look at two types of indexes. Clustered index, you know what a clustered index is, right? That means it's a table, but the data is organized by a key. A non-clustered index is a separate object that points to the clustered index. If I have, let's say, a text book or a technical book, I would say most of the time there is a section in the back of the book that is an index. All right? It's a section in the back. If I need to look something up, let's say I had a book about SQL Server and I wanted to look up the term non-clustered index, I would find that in that index and it would tell me which page in the book I could find more information. I love that because guess what? SQL Server also stores the data on pages and the non-clustered index will tell us how to find the page in the table. Another great example, and the reason I don't have a graphic of an index in the back of the book is I'm not a photographer and I was not able to find a great picture of an index in the back of the book. So maybe if I find one, I can change my graphic. But another one of my favorite examples of a non-clustered index is the card catalog in the library. When I was a child, I loved looking at the card catalog. Uh, there's not many of these around. If you're a fan of the Big Bang Theory, they have one on the set. So next time you watch that show, pay attention to the living room. There is a card catalog. I also saw one at my local library uh, when I took my grandson there. I was so excited, I ran over, there was nothing in it, it was empty. But I spent a lot of time as a child looking through these. So a non-clustered index is a separate object. It has information about the table. So in my library example, uh, the table is going to be all the books in the library. The index is going to tell me how to find that book, but it also has quite a bit of information in it. It's got a title, it's got an author, so if we think of nonfiction, actually fiction books, if we think of like novels, it's got an author, it's got a title, it tells me the year it was published, it has a couple of sentences about what the book's about, there's quite a bit of information I can get just from this index without ever going and finding the actual book. So that's how non-clustered indexes work. It's really great if I write a query and SQL Server can get everything that is needed out of that non-clustered index, that smaller object, without ever looking at the table. I really, really like that. That's the best case scenario. Get everything we need out of the non-clustered index. Don't even touch the table. And here's another thing. Let's say we have a heap. Did you know that we can put non-clustered indexes to point to a heap? So even though we have a heap, it's all, you know, it's, we don't have to always scan the table. Because if we have a non-clustered index and we can use that, the non-clustered index has pointers to the right row in the heap. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So let's go back to the code. And we'll take a look at some indexes. There are many ways we can look at indexes. One thing we can do is we can run SP help index and it will give us some information all about the index. All, this is all the indexes in this particular table. So there's four indexes. It's telling us whether it's a non-clustered index or a clustered index. It's telling us some other information about it and also gives us the keys. In this case, it looks like only one key per index. We can have multiple keys. I go over to Object Explorer. Let's take a look production product, and if I expand indexes, there are those same indexes. And I can look at the properties 
of the index. There we go. And, and see it this way tells me some other information about it. Tells me that the product is unique, it's clustered, you know. And that's, this is also where I could create indexes if I would like. Um, or I can, and notice that I cannot create another clustered index. Because remember, only one clustered index per table. All right, so let's run this query. And I'm going to turn that on. And if I look at the execution plan, I can see that it did an index seek on a non-clustered index. If you look in the middle there, just to the right of my cursor, actually I can move, oops, I move it then it goes away. I can see the object, AdventureWorks 2014, DBO, Big Transaction History, and the name of the index that was actually used. Okay. So in this case, it didn't even, it could have used, actually no, it used a particular index that had the product ID. Okay. So it's very, very efficient. Um, there's also ways to look at indexes through the metadata. There are, you know, sys.indexes, uh, there's uh, probably sys.columns, I can't remember exactly, all the metadata table names, but we can also write queries to look at indexes that way as well. All right, so let's go back to the slides. So this looks pretty familiar. The non-clustered index structure is also a B tree or balanced tree. It has the root at the top. It has non-leaf levels that contain the key. So in this case, um, let, it's probably, if we think about that library example, the key would be, uh, you know, author name, book title, okay? Oops. And the leaf level repeats the key, and it contains other columns called included columns, all right? And, whoops, I am on the wrong one. There we go. So the leaf level contains the key and a pointer to the actual table row. If it's pointing to a clustered index, it's going to have the cluster key. If it's pointing to a heap, and I think I've got maybe a slide that, yep, got a slide that explains that. Let me just talk about included columns for a second. Included columns are extra pieces of information, all right? Included columns, uh, for example, in our library example, the included columns would be the date that the book was published and the little couple sentences to tell you what the book's about. It also has a pointer to the table row. If it's pointing to a clustered index, it's going to have the cluster key as included in that. If it's pointing to a heap, it's going to have a row identifier. Again, that's a number we don't care about. Uh, it's just something SQL Server uses under the covers to help figure out what's or keep track of that table. All right. Let's go ahead and run this one really quickly. And it looks like my t I've got about 15 minutes left. So this is I probably have more material than I can use in this short of a time period. Um, all right, so if I look at, I'll just run these two queries together. I look at the execution plan, and here's another thing about execution plans. If I run more than query at one at a time, I can look at the relative uh, work or cost of each query. So the first one, all I did was do select star from the table. Obviously, I'm going to scan the entire table. Here, I did a clustered index seek. I'm using, and this is not, okay, so I thought I would be looking at non-clustered indexes here. But I, since I'm, I'm searching on the cluster key, it did a clustered index seek. All right, so two ways of looking at that table. What if I wanted to look at some of the other 
columns, have a different column in the where clause. So like name, that came up pretty quickly. If I look at the execution plan, I can see that what SQL Server did was an index seek. There's an index on the product name. SQL Server was able to use that index. It was able to do a seek, the really fast search, and find exactly the row that I needed. If I look here, it looked at two pages. This is a relatively small table. Uh, so it's not going to look at very many. It probably looked at one index page and one data page. I look here. In this case, SQL Server did a clustered index scan. So why did it do that? The reason is that there's no non-clustered index that has the color column in it. <clears throat> So since there's no non-clustered index with the color column, SQL Server had to go to the actual table and scan through the entire table to find all those rows. If I look at the messages, I can see that SQL Server did 15 logical reads. Well, guess what? That table's small. That's really the only logical reads in that table. There's really not that many rows in the table. Okay really that not that many pages in the table. Another thing to think about is column order. It's really, really important. Um, for example, let's say you had an index on a list of people and the column order was last name, first name, and city. If my queries always have last name as a predicate, as one of the search predicates, SQL Server will be able to seek, will be able to do a very efficient search in that index and find the rows. If for some reason you decide to do a search on first name or city, SQL Server can still take advantage of that index. However, SQL Server will have to scan through the index. Um, if let's say we had a phone book, it's going to be a little phone book. And if you remember phone books from back in the day, if you're from a small town, you had a phone book, small phone book. If you did not remember the first name of someone and you tried to find them in that phone book, you would have to look at every entry in that entire book. If you know the last name, you can jump quickly to the correct rows or actually in the phone book example, to the correct pages and find the data that you're looking for. So column order is really important. So let's look at this one. We have a table called person person. There is an index, just like I was talking about, that has First name, last name, first name, and middle name. If I would do a search on last name, what SQL Server will do, in this case there were three logical reads, the execution plan shows an index seek, so that means that it used that index and it very efficiently found the correct rows. There were 86 rows that it found. What if I instead only had the first name and did not have last name as a predicate in my query? In that case, I've got 69 rows returned. SQL Server had to do 109 logical reads. It had to scan the index. So it didn't jump to the table. There was an index, a non-clustered index it could use to find the data, but it scanned that index. Is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. It's, we can't have an index for every single query that exists. So this is really not that bad. Um, at least it's scanning a smaller object. It's not scanning the table, it's scanning the small index, small object. And what SQL Server is suggesting is that we create a query or create an index on first name. We may or may not want to do that. If this is something we're going to be doing, writing queries constantly on first name, might be a good idea. If it's a one-off, we definitely do not want to do that. 
Another concept is covering index. Um, it almost sounds to me like the term means there's a switch, there's a property I can turn on to make an index covering. But that is not the case. A covering index basically means that I have an index that is adequate that that covers a query. So it's really a situational thing. It describes a situation, not an index. I have a particular query and this index has everything in it. I need to uh, run the query without touching the table. So let's go ahead. I'm not going to go do the last piece. I've got a little bit more information that I really can cover in this in this time slot. Okay, so what I'm going to do is create a copy of one of the tables and I've added a primary key which will actually create the clustered index. I'm going to turn statistics IO on and now when I run this query I get a clustered index scan. Okay, because all I've got on this table is a clustered index and it's on the combination of sales order ID and sales order detail ID. All right, so to make things work better, I could add a non-clustered index on product ID. Okay, we did that. So let's run this one and see what, see what happens. I have got, so remember, even though this non-clustered index is only on product ID, the fact it, it contains the cluster key. Every non-clustered index will contain the cluster key. So I get an index seek. That's fantastic. I love to see that. Here's the problem. What if I decide one day to add another column to this query? The query looks almost the same except I've added another column. Now the plan looks very different. Let's just move that up and move that up. I have what's called a key lookup. That's bad news most of the time. Again, we can't clear up all the key lookups in our database. We probably will never be able to have all the indexes we need for every single query, but this is one of the things I look for. What this means is that this query was able to, or SQL Server was able to get sales order ID and product ID out of the non-cluster index, but it had to make a trip to the table to get order quantity. Notice also you can see the relative cost. 99% of the effort was taken by using, by doing this key lookup. And in fact, sometimes the cost is so high if you have a large number of rows, sometimes SQL Server will not even do the index seek and it just ignore the, it won't ignore the non-clustered index, but sometimes it's more efficient to go back and do a clustered index scan instead of doing the key lookup because the cost of the key lookup is so high. So what I'm going to do, I'm not going to add another index, I'm just going to modify my existing one. The only way I can modify my existing one is by dropping it and recreating it. Even if I use Object Explorer and use the GUI, that's what it's doing under the covers. So let's go ahead and do that. So what I, let me go back and look at this again. Here's my key. All right, that's what I'm going to have in the top, the non-leaf levels, the product ID. In the leaf level, it's going to repeat product ID. It's going to have the cluster key that's the pointer back to the table and I also have this other piece of information order quantity that's in included column uh, in the dictionary not the dictionary but in the um, library example that would be like the uh, year the book was published okay so let's run this query again uh, you know what, we're going to run this one. This is exactly, I've got some other keys here, other things here. Let's run this one again. And this time, 
we've got completely an index seek and we're no longer doing the key lookup. So this is much more efficient. We get logical reads too. So I don't think I checked the logical reads before, but it would have been a lot higher uh, with the with the uh, key lookup. So I'm going to skip the searchability and just talk a little bit about non-clustered index best practices. It's possible to have 999 non-clustered indexes. There's cer certain situations where a large number of that, like that, is fine. Uh, most of the time, it's good rule of thumb is around 10. The reason that we don't want to have too many is that SQL Server must maintain those non-clustered indexes and you can start to see a decrease in your update and delete performance at some point. Um, it's good to have non-clustered indexes on foreign keys. It's good to have non-clustered indexes on common where clause columns. Um, I've noticed when I'm joining, SQL Server generally likes to have uh, the where clause column first, then the join columns. He likes to filter first most of the time. Uh, use your workload to tune. Just don't go in and start guessing. Uh, use some queries to tune to figure out what you really need. Um, I have the thing about filtering before joining. And take advantage of included columns. Try to avoid those key lookups and make things as efficient as possible. So that is my presentation. So we'll go ahead and see if we've got some questions. Yeah, uh, so would you, uh, somebody is asking if you could uh, share the slides and as well as the code? Yes, I will go ahead and send those to you and then you mm -hmm. can put them along with the with the record, or if you're doing a recording I'm assuming. Yes. Uh, okay, so yeah, you can go ahead, I'll send those to you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so another question is that uh, um, maybe Nicole, uh, I can, I probably can unmute her and see if she would ask you directly. Give me a second. Yeah, I see the question in the oh, chat okay. window. So she's saying okay. um, she she has hundreds of tables with tens of millions of rows, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of rows each. Uh, very few have primary keys, which is unusual. Uh, some tables have dozens of non-clustered indexes. How do you determine if you have too many indexes and if you have applied the right indexes, where they're needed, can you have too many, uh, can they compete with one another? So one thing that you can do, there's a gentleman uh, named Glenn Berry, and um, he has some, if I go out, let me go out and do a search for Glenn real quick. He has a lot of really great queries that you can run, and you can actually find a query that, a, a metadata query to see exactly which indexes you're really using. Uh, don't run this right after a restart. But run it after you know when the when the server's been going for a while, um, because if I do a search for the word bad in Glenn Berry's information, that's not it. Let's find the find the get this thing out of the way. Um, he's got a query possible bad non-clustered indexes. So he's saying if there's more reads than writes, which is, I don't quite like that, but I look for queries that are never being used for reads. Queries that are never being used in select statements that only are being written for, that's one thing you can do. Um, and that question is hard to just answer in one you know, thing like this. I, I would say probably you need to um, engage with someone who can help you. Uh, someone like, you know, that's one of the things that I do, an index, queer, index tuning engagement. There's a lot of other SQL Server uh, people out there, consulting companies that can do this. So, um, and when I do it, I teach, unless, unless the customer doesn't care about learning how to do it, 
I will give them all the scripts that I run and walk through what I do. Uh, one thing that I do is we look for indexes that are overlapping, we look for indexes that SQL Server reporting is missing, we look at the top queries, look to see you know, how we can improve those with indexes, so it's, it's an entire process. So um, it's kind of difficult to answer in, in just a, a couple, you know, a couple minutes like this. But, um, you know, if you start looking at some of uh, Glenn's things, he, he's got some really, really helpful queries that can give you a better idea if those indexes that you have are useful. Would you be able to send me that link as well, <laughs> Glenn Berry? Yeah. Yeah, uh, right. yeah. He did. Be... Uh, he did a presentation in the past for our virtual chapter, but that was a, a different kind of topic. Yeah, he's. I'll paste it in the chat window, mm -hmm. um, because it depends on which version of SQL Server you're running. Right. Yeah. So he's one of the. Paste it in the chat window. I'm not sure if it went out to everybody. Actually, let me do this. If I send it to... Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I, I can uh, paste, I can I paste like it. I can, okay, because yeah. it looks like yeah. I can only do it to just organizers. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's the link. And so he's really done a lot to help the SQL Server community. This is just amazing information that he's, he's put together here. So, but that's, you know, think, you. one of the things I look, because what I see a lot of times is I'll see, like in one table, uh, there'll be an index on column A, and then there'll be another index on column A and column B, and then there'll be another index on column A, column B, column C. Well, you really don't need all of those. You just need one of them, you know, so those so duplic means duplicate indexes are a big problem as well. Right. Uh, would that cause a, uh, quite a bit of uh, overhead when it could it could it could increase the overhead in a couple of different ways. Number one, those indexes have to be maintained. So every time you modify data, inserts, updates, deletes, SQL Server also has to modify the index data. The other thing that's an issue is when you do your index maintenance, your rebuilds, reorgs, um, now you're sp spending more time, you maybe your chances are if you have hundreds of millions of rows, maybe your window to do maintenance is pretty small and you've got all these extra indexes that you don't really need so that index rebuild job is going to take a lot longer. So that's another issue. Um, if you're doing something like always on availability groups, you know, you want to be really, really efficient on your index rebuilds because you don't want your availability groups to get any, you know, get further behind than they, they might need to be. So, but you definitely, definitely can have some problems. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, can you add indexing partition tables? Yes, you can add indexes to partition tables. You definitely want to do that. You can also partition the indexes themselves, which is a cool thing. I haven't done a ton of work with partition tables, um, but uh, you know you definitely can do that. You can partition the indexes as well, and that's really neat because. Um, when you're doing index maintenance, you can, depending on which version of SQL Server you're running, because features keep changing so quickly, but you can even re-index a partition at a time, you know, on your indexes. So, cool. great question. Yeah. Is it uh, advisable to disable cluster indexes before a data insert? What can be impact? So that sounds kind of like a staging situation. Um, if you drop your clustered index, what's going to also happen 
is your non-clustered index are going to be rebuilt behind the scenes. Um, some places will do that. They will drop, so a staging situation, they might drop the clustered indexes and then reload them to get the, to get the load to go faster. I think it's one of those it depends things. Maybe you need to test to see if it, if it really speeds it up at all. But it definitely will impact the non-clustered indexes. Because think about a non-clustered index. If the non-clustered index is pointing to a heap, then the non-clustered index has a row identifier to point to the row. If the non-clustered index is pointing to a clustered index, then it's going to have the cluster key. So this, the, if you drop the clustered index, then all the non-clustered indexes are going to reconfigure and rebuild under the covers you know, with that new structure. Then when you put the clustered index back on, then the non-clustered indexes have to do that again because now they're pointing at a clustered index. So I would definitely do some testing to make sure that you are getting a benefit. Um, you may or may not be. When you say um, it re rebuilds behind the scenes, mm -hmm. uh, once you, you drop it, that it does that happen automatically, or you have to yeah. kind of yeah, it happens it. automatically. Because let me go back to the non-clustered index. Um, so if I have a non-clustered index, the leaf level contains the the key, the same thing as up here, plus it has a pointer to the table row. If the non-clustered index is pointing to a clustered index, it has a cluster key. Okay? So now if I go ahead, now if I drop the clustered index, now all of a sudden my non-clustered index is pointing to a heap. So SQL Server has to recreate that non all the non clustered indexes you know because it's pointing to a heap it has something different in it now then we do the load process and then we add the clustered index back now SQL Server has to rebuild recreate the non clustered indexes again because now they're pointing to a clustered key again so it's I would definitely do some testing to see if you're if you're really getting benefit. Maybe you are, maybe you are not, because there's SQL Server is having to do a lot of extra work by dropping, by putting that cluster index, you know, taking it off and putting it back on. That is a lot of work. More than just the clustered index, it's affecting the non-clustered indexes as well. Makes sense. Um... So somebody is asking to give another talk uh, at um, intermediate level of indexing. <laughs> okay, um, and I don't have one ready, but it would be interesting, like where we talk about uh, maybe the joins, talk about fragmentation. Um, you know, this one is definitely a, a very basic talk. Um, but these concepts are important, especially for beginners or people that just really haven't thought about indexes. So if they have some particular areas that they would like to see, if they could if they could get that information to me to give me some ideas on what this talk should have. I know joining. I had no joins in this talk whatsoever. So that would be really, really a great thing to talk about as well. Cool. Um, so, what's the difference between logical fragmentation and average fra uh, average fra fragmentation in an on an index? Average fragmentation. I wonder if there's another word. Um, I when uh, I hi, think. Hi, This is me. Okay. Uh, no, I, I was the one who asked the question. Uh, so, actually, uh, from the index physical stack DMV, right? Uh, I actually noticed two problems. Like one is logical fragmentation and average fragmentation. So average. I basically okay. yeah. So I basically look into the average fragmentation and take the decision whether to rebuild or reorganize. But uh, I had a query from one of the client saying that uh, 
uh, they are very much concerned on the logical fragmentation. So I just want to understand how exactly. That right, works. And, and I don't remember. I know what I've done. I know I have one customer where we've looked at the because the fragmentation can be in two places. It can be in the non-leaf, the key part, and it can be in the leaf level. Um, so I'm not exactly familiar with average and logical. However, I do know that it can be in the leaf level and it can't or in the non-leaf level and it can be in the leaf level. So I know the difference between doing a reorg and a rebuild. If I do a reorg, it only fixes the fragmentation in the leaf level. If I do a rebuild, it takes care of everything. Um, I might have to look into that. Um, so you're looking at one of the DMVs that talks about um, it's not the sys DM. I can't remember. I never remember the, the DMVs because I always have a query I go copy and paste. Um, but if you want to send me the query that you're looking at, looking for, maybe I can uh, do some research and get back to you on that question. Uh, sure. Actually, what happened was even though we did reorganize, we did rebuild. So despite rebuild, we see that the logical fragmentation was same. It did not uh, reduce. If you so do a re if you do a rebuild, that's going to rebuild the pages. All of the the index will actually be rebuilt. However, it's possible that the index may be on uh, spread over different extents. So, does it ha have something to do with that? Uh, that's what, uh, uh, when we see the logical fragmentation, it was not uh, reduced, so it was same despite rebuilding multiple times. Okay, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, I've really f focused more on where inside the index, that's, at least for what I've done, have focused on is the fragmentation in the non-leaf, or in the leaf, because I have one customer that's got a uh, 15 terabyte database. So we're trying to, to, and they're also using availability groups. So rebuilding the indexes and doing just regular maintenance blows things up. So what we're doing is we're actually looking at every index and determining where the fragmentation is. If the fragmentation is only in the leaf level, we do a reorg. If the fragmentation is in the non-leaf, we do a rebuild, which is different than what most of the people are doing where they just base it on a percent. For this particular database, to get this to work, that's, that's what we've done. Um, so I'll have to look into this. Um, can you, I don't know how to get, um, let's see, let well, me put my, how he can contact me. Maybe through an email. Or maybe uh, he can send, send me the email. I'll forward it to you. Okay. That that sounds great. And let me look into it to see. Because, I mean, logical makes sense. Um, average, I'm not sure of. Um, but, um, you know, like I said, I mostly pay attention to whether it's in the leaf level or the non-leaf level. And I'm not really sure exactly if one of these terms of if these terms apply to that or if they're looking at like log like fragmentation at the disk level like for example across multiple extents okay other questions yeah um, so uh, this lady is, a lady is asking if you can uh, drop a non cluster index I'm guessing what she's getting at is uh, maybe you can drop it before you do an insert then rebuild? Yeah, I mean, you can definitely drop non clustered indexes. You can also disable them. However, I think to re enable them, I think it gets rebuilt again. So I don't know what use, uh, what really great use that is. Um, but you can definitely drop non clustered indexes. And I think I even did that during one of the demos. I dropped an index and then I uh, created it again with another column. Mm -hmm. So I guess this is mostly for um, loading data. 
you know, mm -hmm. to make the loading more efficient when you drop yeah. it first. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard of shops doing that. Again, it's something, you know, to test and make sure that it you actually are uh, loading faster. But yeah, you definitely can do that. Um, You know, again, it just tests to see if it's if it's faster, if it actually causes you more time to rebuild those indexes again. But uh, if if you don't drop them and just do a large insert, would that mm -hmm. cause index uh, fragmentation? It could. It depends on the structure of that index. If the data is getting loaded in order of the key, the index will probably not be fragmented. If the index is getting loaded in a different order, well then it probably will be fragmented. So, um, so what's going to end up happening is some of the indexes will be fragmented and some of them will not be by the large. It just depends on what that key is. Say like if somebody doesn't, I mean, some tables don't have keys, then it'll make it. Uh, I mean, I mean, the source data doesn't have a key, then mm -hmm. it may, it will make it fragmented, right? Right. Well, so really, what happens is that you have pages, um, and if there's not enough room for those new rows to go that new row will go, you'll have a page split, that new row will go somewhere to another page and you'll have pointers. Um, so if you have non-clustered indexes, the non-clustered index has a key even if the table does not. So I would say if you do a large load of data, some of those non-clustered indexes are going to be fragmented. Some of them may not be. Um, that's just kind of how it is. It depends on the structure of the index. It just depends on how much free space is in the pages, which um, also depends on the fill factor and you know things like that. So you, you're always going to get fragmentation. There's there's no way around it. You will always get fragmentation as data is inserted, updated, deleted. That's why database administrators do index maintenance on a periodic basis. I see. Yeah. So uh, this gentleman is asking, if, what, what did you mean by filter before joining columns? Um, I have seen, and I don't have an example handy, I have seen queries, and we didn't go into joining, but um, most of the time in uh, execution plans, I'm seeing that SQL Server would like an index. Let's say you have a, a join, and on one of the tables, we're going to filter on a particular column and join on a different column. SQL Server likes to do the filtering up front if possible. So that's why it seems to me, again, it's one of those it depends things, but it seems to me like it makes more sense to put the uh, the filter column first, then the join column, and what you could do is create two indexes and create uh, both of them and with just different orders and see what SQL Server does, you know, see what SQL Server prefers. But in my experience, it seems like SQL Server likes to filter before joining. You know, I'm sure that's not 100% across the board, but I have seen that quite a bit. So that's kind of my recommendation. Again, it just depends on the situation and you got to test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, well, Mary is asking um, for follow up uh, with the question, dropping the cluster index will affect the non-cluster index. Will it be Will it be possible to drop all indexes when insert billions of rows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could drop all of them if you want. You just would have to have a script in order to recreate them. You'd have to have a script of what they were before they were dropped. So you could run a script that um, you know drops all the indexes, do your upload of data, 
and then you'd have to have a script to add them all back. So you'd have to have all those definitions, but it's definitely possible to do. Again, test to make sure that you're actually saving time. That's true. Yep. But with this many rows to insert, it definitely will get, uh, will have to rebuild the indexes, right? Otherwise, if you're, uh, if, if you're dropping all of them, then inserting the data, and then recreating the indexes, they'll all be in perfect shape mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're doing that because you're creating them all from scratch, right? So if you, if you do that, they will all be in perfect shape, once, you know, as, as good as they can be. Um, when they're recreated, they won't be fragmented. If the indexes are in place during the load, you will get some fragmentation. So for the best practice, maybe it's it's good to drop them first and then rebuild? I'm not, I don't think there is a best practice for this. I think it depends on the situation because maybe it's faster to leave them in place and to do an index rebuild or index maintenance afterwards. Maybe it's faster to drop them all, do the load, and then recreate them. You know, I, I don't know which way would be faster. Mm -hmm. it's, it will depend on the workload. So, yeah, this uh, continue about uh, the filter. Uh, she's asking maybe you can filter uh, use a subquery before you do a join? Well, um, I, so let me see, bring up a, I can get SSMS to come up again. I guess I've killed it. Um, well, there it is. So basically what you're saying is try to force SQL Server to do something in a certain order. Um, you know, that might help. So basically you're saying select star, I'm going to say star, it probably won't be star, from mm -hmm. table A join select star from table B where A equals seven. Yeah, that on has a, you know that something like that. I mean, you can try it and see what happens. The thing is, SQL Server is going to come up with a particular plan to solve this. It may not be what you think. Um, so this is a situation where it looks like we're forcing SQL Server to do the where clause first, but it probably is going to, in my experience, if there's a good index in place that'll let it do it. Depends on what indexes are in place. Um, you know, you really have to have the situation to see, see what happens. So I could see something like table A dot ID equals B dot ID, something like that. Um, would I create my index with A first and then B, or then ID on table B? That's usually what I see. But what you might do is create an index, create two indexes. Create one index on table B that starts with A and then ID. Create another index that starts with ID and then A see which one SQL Server is going to use in that situation. You know, do this in a test environment and just see what happens. In my experience, SQL Server is probably going to use this one. It likes to filter first. Even if I did it, wrote the query, like select, I'm not going to do a star, I'm just doing that for expediency. <laughs> You know, this might be exactly the same query as far as SQL is concerned. Even though we've written it different, chances are it's, it's going to be the same query. Um, 
all you can do is go out and test. In my experience, SQL Server is going to probably filter first because then it's got a smaller number of rows it has to join to A. You know, so that might be a good um, topic for an intermediate class. Go ahead and write some queries uh, like this. Come up with different scenarios. Test to see which, which index SQL Server is more likely to use. What happens if we had this index there instead of this one? How would the plan be different? So that, that would be a really great topic. Yeah. You know. So we'll, we'll see. That would be a great talk. I will work on it. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. Uh, another quick question is that, um, say like you have a sales table that has cost um, and then number of um, items the customer ordered. Would you include the cost and uh, number of items ordered, those columns as uh, in the Cluster or yeah, well, sorry, in a non-cluster index. If they are needed in a query, I would. Even no. though they're okay. So like Even if I, they're... yeah. So if I did something like this, um, B call one, B call two, I might write my in, I might write my uh, index like uh, create index test on table B. A comma ID include column one, column two. So um, if I don't do this, SQL Server is going to do key lookups to get these columns. And if possible, I want to avoid key lookups because they're very expensive. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I can't I can't have, or it's very unlikely that I will have the perfect index for every query that I write. But for queries that are very uh, frequently used, I really want to avoid key lookups because they, well, they are the source of a lot of performance problems. So, if um, if that uh, with different queries you need different columns, would you include all of the columns in a? Uh, Non-clustered index to avoid, yeah. you know, madness. You can, you can. I think it's not something that you want to do that often. You know, so let's say that table B had 30 columns. I could add all of them here. Um, then I'm now I've got an index that's pretty big. Um, it, do I have do I have a lot of queries that could really take advantage of that? then I might do it. But if I'm just doing it just to do it, I would say no. So if I have a real case, if I have a real reason, I might do it. I have a customer right now that I'm working with. They have this one very large table that's used in lots and lots of queries. And there are they've actually got two or three indexes like that where they've included all the other. It's basically a copy of the table, just indexed differently. Um, in that situation, it helped them a lot. Across the, I would say most of the time you are not going to want to do that. It really depends on the workload. In that situation, it did help them. Most of the time you are not going to want to do that because that makes that index really big. We've just basically now got another copy of the table. Um, what I suspect could happen, if you see that you really need to do that, um, Maybe, I, I'm afraid to even say it, maybe the cluster index is not on the correct key. You've created the cluster index on uh, the primary key. Maybe in that situation, if you need another cop copy of the table indexed a different way, maybe that should have been your clustered index to begin with. You know, who's, who knows? It's going to depend on the situation. You know, so as a general rule of thumb, I would say no, don't do that. But I have seen situations where it was necessary. Uh, is it a good? Uh, is it good to create indexing query to get data, then drop the index, a way of temp index for performance? 
I wouldn't do that on a production system. I would not do that. Um, so basically, I need to write a query, so I'm just going to create an index for that, and then now I'm going to drop it. I, so for basically one-off queries, I would say no. Um, if, it's a, if it's a development environment, I might do something like that, but generally no, I, I probably wouldn't. Um, maybe the exception to the, that would be, let's say you've got a process that runs once a year, um, and that process that's only reason for this index is for that yearly process. Maybe then I would go ahead and add that index, run that yearly process, and drop it. But otherwise, just one-off queries, I would not be creating indexes for one-off queries, no. Mm -hmm. So if you have multiple columns to form a uh, primary key, and mm -hmm. would, would you would you use that uh, as the primary index, and, or if it's better just to create a, um, a surrogate key and use that instead? Okay, um, it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. Really, really depends. Um, in so frequently. The primary key, be it one or more columns, ends up being the cluster key by default. Uh, for a particular table, that may or may not be the best way. It depends on how we're accessing that data. You know, if we're always accessing by date, maybe it would make sense to have the cluster key, that date column, and just have a unique index on the primary key. You know, there's no rule of thumb here. It, it's that it depends answer. It depends on the situation. It, really, if there, were, if there was one answer <laughs> to all of this, um, boy, SQL Server would be so easy. SQL Server is not really <laughs> super difficult. But yeah, it, it, you have to look at your workload. Is it an OLTP workload? Is it a data warehouse workload? What's this table for? How do we access this table? You know, so it's it, there, a lot of thought needs to go into it. Most of the time, that thought doesn't go in there. We identify the primary key, that ends up the cluster key by default. Most of the time, that's fine. You know, sometimes it would maybe make, you know, whenever we get the situation where we want to create a non clustered index on a key and have every single column included, maybe that should have been the clustered index. <laughs> You know, if we have a situation like that. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jujubi, uh, can, can you uh, go ahead and ask your question? Because I don't understand. You you only say why or why not. I'm not sure okay. what you're asking. Okay, my question is regarding continuing to what the last question answered. So, Kathy, you said. Um, Normally, you will not create an index just for in the production, just for uh, reporting paper for the for once and drop it. Mm -hmm. uh, I work in a reporting team. We we normally most of report we are pulling from our uh, our TP. So what we do we so it's a for example it's a monthly run report or quarterly run. We'll sometimes people just create a table. Then they will create an index. Then we will drop the index and drop the table. So that okay. is my yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's fine. Again, it's like mm -hmm. almost almost everything that you mm -hmm. can ever say. Um, there's a lot of times there's a use case. As a general rule of thumb, I think that would be a bad idea, because if I have like an OLTP, uh, not yeah, tr well not. It's like a transactional database, right. and I start adding indexes, I'm going to start locking things and causing problems. Uh, for this situation that you talked about, it's right. probably fine. So, again, you know, as a rule of thumb, I wouldn't do that, but if you have a business case and it's working for you, then, you know, go ahead and do it. Um, there was one thing I did that I would say never do. Mm -hmm. Don't do that on a production system. 
but almost mm -hmm. everything else, <laughs> almost <laughs> everything else, there's going to be a use case, you know, like in the SQL community, everybody says, oh, uh, cursors are terrible, don't ever use cursors, don't ever use cursors. Well, guess what? There are situations where a cursor is the right answer. It's right. not that often, but, you know, it's, there you have all these different tools. There's all these different things you can use. Um, maybe a particular thing is not done that often, but there's, you know, there, if there's a particular reason, then you do it. So. Is there a better way than what we do not? What we I just described is a better option, or um, maybe are you we, using temp tables? Maybe are you you're actually using regular tables for the report? Sometimes we use temp table. Sometimes we use physical table. Yeah. So um, temp tables. If I have reports and they're actually using temp tables, that is does seem like a very good reason to add indexes on the fly and that temp table is just going to be gone you know right. that's that's fine um, mm -hmm. if it's a particular so in this case it's not like you have your production tables that transactions are going against and you're just randomly adding an index to run one query um, so you're creating separate tables like a work table adding indexes you know that seems fine so you have a whole process it's part of a whole process you're so the, the original question sounded like oh I'm gonna run a query I'm just gonna add an index you know just kind of like uh, just I running see. a one-off so you've actually got a process in place that you know works so that's different uh, I see so yeah. what I'm what we are talking is is just for our reporting purpose is not for the insert update okay okay yeah. is that what you mean okay yeah, that's so that's okay. different. Yeah, the original question, it was like, you've got this system and, you know, oh, I want to run a query, I'm just going to add an index. You've got a separate whole process that you're doing that works for you. That's, that's really a different scenario. All right. Any more questions? I guess uh, that's all we have. Thank you so much, Kathy, for a great presentation. Uh, we really okay. learned a lot. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, and I will talk to you later, and I'll send the uh, slides to you. Okay. I will right. share on our website. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, we are adjourned. Sarah.